Okay, a good vach. We just read in the Haftorah this morning how on that day, on that day, Yitaka Vashefer Gadol, the great shofar will be sounded, and all those who are lost in the land of Mitzrayim, the land of Egypt, and all those who are cast aside in the, um, I'm sorry, those who are lost in the land of Assyria, those who are cast aside in the land of Egypt, will come to bow down to Hashem in Yerushalayim. And Hasidus explains that Egypt and Assyria refer respectively to the challenge of wealth and the challenge of poverty. And when Mashiach comes, we hear the great shofar, so all those Jews, whatever, whatever's going on, whatever's confusing us, when we hear the shofar, the shofar is going to touch the heart of every Jew. Every Jew is going to want to come to Hashem, to Yerushalayim, to be with Mashiach. There is a famous parable that the Rebbe once shared about the meaning of blowing the shofar, which origin of this parable is from Rebbe Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev. Levi Yitzhak gave a parable of a king who was lost in the forest, and he um, there's no place to no place to stay, and no he's hungry. And this guy takes the king in, and takes care of the king, and he feeds him, and the king is so appreciative of what this guy has done for the king, that the king decides to reward this person and to make him his personal uh, minister. And the guy is serving the king faithfully for years, but eventually he makes a mistake, and he commits an act which can be considered treason against the king. So the king, tell, the king uh, decides that this guy has to be hung. He went against the king. Do you have any, but he granted this man his last request. What was his last request? Last request was he says to the king, "Your Majesty, I want you to wear the same clothing you wore when you were lost in the forest. Now, I want to wear the same clothes and clothing that I wore when you were lost in the forest." And that way, the king put on the clothing. He puts on the clothing, and the king remembered how when no one else wanted to take him in, this guy was there and this guy took him in. And that aroused the king's mercy for this guy and he absolved him from punishment for his, for his uh, mistake. In a similar way, when, when Hashem gave us the Torah, he asked all the other nations of the world if they wanted the Torah first and no one else wanted the Torah. So when we blow, and when God gave us the Torah, the shofar was sounded. So we blow the shofar to remind God how when no one else wanted God, we the Jewish people were there and we wanted God. That's, that's one of the reasons we, we blow the shofar. On that note, uh, I want to share with you an amazing story about a legendary chassid. His name was Rebbe Chaim. Rebbe Chaim um, was one of the chassidim who, in Soviet Russia, dedicated himself to teaching Torah underground and suffered tremendously with Mr. Nefesh, with personal sacrifice to teach Torah and to preserve Torah in communist Russia. And he um, heard, as many others did, that after World War II, when Poland wanted to bring back its citizens to Poland, Russia was allowing Polish citizens to return. And if you had a Polish passport, you could leave Russia and go to Poland. So many Hasidim, as I shared a few months ago, uh, made false passports to get to Poland. Rebecca told his children, Motel and Meir Simcha, Aleya Mashalom, that we, we are going to leave Russia. Imagine how excited these kids were. We're going to leave Russia. We're going to leave this place of suffering for so many years. We're going to be able to be free to keep the Torah and mitzvahs. So they head towards Lvov. And before they um, get on the train to leave, Lvov is in the border town from Russia and Poland, before they get on the train, this this fancy limo pulls up to to the uh, uh, train, and they they didn't have any reason to believe this was anyone anyone suspicious, but they called Raberka to come into the car, and his wife and children weren't sure what to do, and they said, "We're just taking him for a moment." 
they understood that this wasn't a moment they were arresting him. And they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where he was. They didn't know what was going on. And they, they already had their luggage in the train. They were ready to go, but they took their luggage out and they waited. They waited a month. They waited two months. And they really didn't know what to do. What happened was, was that Eberke was accused of treason uh, because he had uh, make, he was accused of making false Polish passports. He didn't really make the passports, he bought them, but and he was involved and he was accused of this crime and his punishment was death. His, uh, his, his, his wife and the mother of Ramatul and Rebbe and Simcha uh, decided that she wanted her children to leave. They had these passports, they should leave, and, and she would stay behind with Ramatul's uh, Rebecca's father and grand and, and mother, and uh, she will stay a lot behind with them. And she wanted her children, Mayor Simcha Motel, to go to Poland, and so they had to act like as if they were the dad. They had to go stand online in those years, online to get bread, online to get sugar. And meanwhile, she tried trying to figure out what she could do for her husband. So, the ruling of the court again was death. That's a punishment for treason. However, somehow, with lots of bribes and lots of uh, um, uh, lawyers, they managed to commute the sentence from death to 10 years in Siberia. 10 years of hard labor in Siberia to sweeten the sentence. So he ended up going to Siberia and doing hard labor for three years. But they managed to bribe the Soviet officials and for him to leave Siberia, to leave imprisonment after only three, not ten years. But although he was able to leave the prison, he was a fugitive and he was living homeless for trying to find a place to go. And there really wasn't any place he could go because even amongst his fellow Hasidim, there were many... Um, Muslim. There are many people who communicated regularly to the KGB. They had to. It's hard for us to imagine why someone would do this, but the KGB would go over to someone who was religious and they would say to him, we're going to arrest you. And there's a way for you to get out of this arrest. And that is if you agree to report to us just who you see and what's going on, and then you won't be sent to Siberia and then your children won't be orphans and your wife won't be an, a widow. So it's very hard for many people to withstand this challenge. Many people did become reporters, um, moles for the KGB. So Rebecca really had nowhere to go. He couldn't go to the Hasidim, he couldn't go to anyone who else would want to take him. And he was on the run, not for a day, not for a week, not for a month, for 12 years. So for 12 years, he didn't know, he didn't have days, he didn't have nights. He would stay a, a night here, a night there. It was really, really hard. I don't remember who, uh, where this was, but I remember one family, one Hasidic family, that took him in for a while. And what I heard was, I read once, was that Berke, although he was a fugitive, he wanted, not for the sake of getting fresh air, but he wanted for the sake of making a home for God in this lowly realm, this lowly earth, as the Talmud says, God's desire in creation is he wants to have a home in this lowly plain. He would walk outside, you know, bundled up and with a mask on, in order to be able to say words of Torah in the street. That was Eberka. Eberka, actually, when he was in prison, he, his fellow inmates saw that one night he was very upset. Why was he upset? He was upset because it was a night of Hanukkah. And no, and no menorah. And his fellow non-Jewish inmates kept on pressuring him, why are you upset, why are you upset? And finally he told them he wants to light a candle for his religion. And after a few minutes, this same inmate came over to him and said, we've, we've, we've managed to take care of you. We're going to take the lining of our coats, use that for a wick, and then use an onion and a margarine to create a beautiful candle for you. And so he made the bracha, l'hadagner Hanukkah, and the bracha of Asa Nisim, of the same with God's performed miracles for our forefathers in those days and this time, and the bracha of Shechiyanu, 
And of course, saying Shachiyanu there in Russia, you can imagine the tears that he spilled, saying Shachiyanu for thanking God for the menorah there in, in Soviet Russia. So he's on the run for 12 years. In 1969, his son, who I had the privilege of meeting many times, Ramatul Khain, was studying in the yeshiva in 770. He managed to leave Russia and be in the Rebbe's yeshiva in, in New York. And he went to the uh, Rebbe's secretary, and he asked the Rebbe's secretary, his mother was thinking of leaving Russia herself, and out of Russia, she'll be able to uh, perhaps better help her husband as well. In Russia, there's not much she can do. Maybe she should leave Russia herself. She should submit to Ovir. Ovir is the agency in Russia of immigration. Maybe she should submit her, her request for a visa. And what could she do about her husband? Her husband, you know, for, for years, the only, her, she didn't know where her husband was. And what could she do about her husband? But maybe it's the right time for her to leave. So the Rebbe's response was, the, her husband himself should make a request that his family leave Russia. And the Rebbe said, they won't realize that this is him. They won't realize this is the one that they, they've been looking for for years. He should write on the, on the visa request that Berkechein, who the man that the, the communists have had on their top wanted list, the one who has escaped from prison, they say he should write on the papers that Berke Chain is asking for permission to leave Russia. Matel Chain, al Vashom, he couldn't believe this. He was he was certain that uh, this was he didn't understand. He didn't hear right, but yeah, he clarified the Rebbe is very clear. He should ask himself and when write his name that he wants to he wants to ask the authorities for this visa. The message was given to Rebecca to Rebecca Chain. And without any fear whatsoever, you know, if the Rebbe said this, what he needs to do, what he needs to do. And he submitted his request to leave Russia. And indeed, he was, uh, in, by the, the month of Tishrei, in 1961, uh, he was able to live, uh, to leave Russia and to live, move to Kfar Chabad in Israel. He was the first Chassid to leave Russia after Many Chassidim did indeed, were successful in making the false passports back in 1936, but um, 1946. But he was the first one to leave Russia in 1961 after this. And in the summer of 1961, he celebrated the wedding of his son, Meir Simcha. And his friends told him, Nora Berka, your son's getting married, get yourself a new hat. He had a sort of like a sailor, a French hat, a casquette that he would wear. I know in Russia they couldn't wear regular uh, traditional hats. They wore, they wore a casquette. So his friend said to him, get, a, get yourself a regular hat. And so he got himself a hat. And in the, uh, the, the following year, in the month of Tishrei, in the, um, 1962, Tavshin Chavbeis, he came to the Rebbe for, for the first time, and his friends told him again, you know, you're going to the Rebbe, wear the same hat that all the Hasidim wear, don't wear your casket. And the Rebbe wanted that Rebbe should stand next to him when he blew the shofar. I don't know who told this to me, I know this is correct, but perhaps this is in sync with, the Rebbe did share at that Fabring in that day, about the story of the Bredichev that I mentioned before, about the reason for blowing the shofar is to remind Hashem of the uh, of the sacrifice we had to look for God when no one else was. So we were the ones when God gave us the Torah, no other nation in the world wanted the Torah, and we did. So in a similar way, perhaps, the Rebbe asked her Berke to stand next to him when he blew the shofar. And Rebbe Berke wore the new hat that he got, but when it came to Simcha's Torah, he decided, you know what, I'm, all, I'm, listening, I'm not listening to these guys anymore. I want to dance to the Torah the same way I did in Samarkand, in Russia, the same way I did in Yevel, in Russia. I want to wear the same hat I always wore. And uh, he put on his regular hat, he danced to the Torah with great joy. And the next day he put on the black hat, not the casket, the one that everyone else was wearing. And the Rebbe saw him wearing his 
black hat. The Rebbe said he became a modern man, your modern Jew. Take off the hat. Why, what's this? Put on, they want him to put on the casket, the one he always wore in Russia. Again, I think this has to do with the same idea. You know, he was someone who, when no one else was, was looking for God, everyone was frightened to look for God. He and his fellow Hasidim, they looked for God. And wearing that casket is reminiscent of that, of that um, devotion to God. So the Rebbe wanted him to put on the other hat. So his hat was actually in the office of uh, Rebbe Pliskin. And so some, one of, his, one of his, uh, his relatives went to go get his hat. Meanwhile, the Rebbe didn't want this important chassid to be without a double head covering. It is customary of uh, many people to wear a double head covering, especially when saying a blessing or praying. Uh, and so the Rebbe said, put on, a American market, put on an American yarmulke, an American yarmulke on a napkin. So he put a yarmulke on top of his, on top of his, uh, on top of his yarmulke. Um, I, I think the reason for wearing a double head co- co- covering is because it says in Kabbalah there are three parts of the soul which have um, a vessel, they have a, a location in the body where they are contained within. The mind is contained within the brain and the, the ruach, the feeling of love and reverence for Hashem is within the heart. The power of action is in the body. But the transcendent powers of the soul, desire and pleasure and faith and devotion to God, chay and yechida, there are two other transcendent powers of the soul which don't have a location in the body, and that's why we wear a double head covering, a double makif. Makif means something which is transcendent, above our head. So the Rebbe wanted him even that short while to have another makif, to have a double head covering, and to use that n- napkin as his, uh, his, his, his makif. At that for Brengen, Rebbe Berke had brought to the Rebbe a bottle of vodka that, from Russia. And the Rebbe drank a lot of vodka, so much so that the Hasidim were worried for the Rebbe's health, and they wanted the Rebbe not to uh, drink anymore, and not to you know dance anymore. It was it was it was uh, it was they were concerned, and they asked the Rebbe's brother-in-law, the Rashad, to speak to the Rebbe. The Rebbe shouldn't. The Rebbe should end this 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 fabrengen. but the Rebbe continued, and the Rebbe actually said, "We're going to continue the fabrengen until the morning." And the Fabrengen went from 6.30 to 4.30 in the morning. So I think this was the, uh, one of the longest Fabrengens, if not the longest Fabrengen the Rebbe gave. At this Fabrengen, among other things, the Rebbe spoke about the situation of the Jews in Russia, and he spoke about the manner of the, his uh, great-grandfather, the Rebbe Marash, how the Rebbe Marash his manner of service of God and his manner of giving blessings was similar to the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov, we know, did extraordinary miracles. And the Rebbe Arash did extraordinary miracles as well, but there was a difference. The Rebbe Arash, he will, the Baal Shem Tov lived in a state of poverty, but the Rebbe Arash, his way of serving God was with great wealth and abundance. And the Rebbe stood up and he gave a whole talk about the Rebbe Arash while standing, which is very unusual. And he... He said that since there is a group of 10 people here, there's a minion here, and when, just like when there's, like, like, when there's a Jewish court making a ruling, there's a great power, so too there's a whole group of Jews here. There are many minyanim, many groups, many, many Jews here. And so he wanted that they should all together paskin. When Jews make a decision together that something should happen, it should have an effect that God should, should, should listen to them and answer them. And that for bringing, never spoke about how the Marash, his service of God, as the Marash declared, the world says it can't go under an obstacle, go over an obstacle. And I say, said the Marash, to go straight over the obstacle. In other words, his service of God and his blessings were beyond all limitations, beyond nature. And although the Marash had passed away, the Rebbe said, still, Tzaddikim, even after their passing, the Zohar says, are found in this world, even after their passing, even more than their lifetime. And therefore, the Rebbe said this, this, continu- this, this continues. The Ramash's behavior of going beyond nature continues, and especially because at that time, the Rebbe says everything begins with Torah. And since we've received a, a, a teaching of Torah from the Alter Rebbe, and we've studied it together in public, this should be a, a beginning for the Jews who are stuck in behind the Iron Curtain, they should be able to, to leave. That was the content of this, uh, 
of this uh, for bringing the, when the Rebbe Kachin, um uh, left Russia, and actually that year, 1962, um, many people thought that it was impossible for anyone to leave Russia, but the Rebbe's words were fulfilled, and many Jews were able to leave then, and eventually, um, as the Rebbe uh, predicted in the story another time, uh, when the Jews actually did leave Russia before they left, they said that Gorbachev's rise to power will bring freedom for the Jews in Russia, as happened then. Um, should I share one more, one more story, David? We'll stop here. I'll tell you one more story. One more story. All right. Stories like this. I'll share the story the way I heard this um, from Shema Zalman Hecht, all of Hashem, where he shared the story. He gave a radio program years ago in the Velter itself, and he showed the, the following story. He said that Rab Masna lived in a city called Popanaya. The Gemara says that Rav Masna, um, he once announced that in order to have uh, water to be used to bake matzah, the water has to be Maim Shalonu. The word Shalonu has two translations. Shalonu can mean uh, our water, or Shalonu can mean water that's been taken out of the well and has slept. The water has been kept overnight. So the people in Pupanaya, they didn't know the, the other translation of the word Shalonu. They thought Shalonu means water, that, his water. So they all came to, to the Masa the next day with their buckets, give us water. So he explained to them, they misunderstood. But the Chavaz Das explains that the Gemara is saying a story. And the Gemara is Torah. So the Gemara is telling us a story. It, this means that we have to learn something from the story. And the, what we learn from the story is that although there's logically there's no reason to, it didn't make any sense for them to go bring their buckets to their master to ask them for water, like what does that mean? However, we learn from this the great power of the faith we need to have in Sadiqim. And now the faith you have in the Tzaddik itself ha, makes it, is a vessel for the blessings of the Tzaddik. So on that note, he shared a story about the Bnei Yisachar, had a chassid whose name was the Beis of Chaim Alpert. Beis of Chaim, he had a kretschma, he had a little inn, tavern, and where people would stay, and a little, little sort of hotel, and uh, people would, that's how he and his family were um, supported. He lived in the, the town of Munkach, and he was a chassid of the Bnei Yisachar, and there were, at that time, in Munkach, there was a lot of upheaval, uh, there was there were a lot of wars going on, and th- this army arrived in Munkach, and the, wait, the army decided to take possession of many homes to support the needs of the army. Among the many homes they took possession of was the home and the tavern of of, uh, of this chassid, of Albert. So you can't really argue with the army, but the, there was the following thing happened that of course caused great angst and frustration and anguish to Rebbe Sochaim. The general that was in charge of this army had a ring, a diamond ring, that he had received from the king because of his great service to the army. And he, uh, he the ring was, was, was lost. And so the general suspected, looked anywhere he could, he suspected that it was a Jew who had stolen the ring. So he told Rabbi Sochaim that you have 48 hours to give back the ring or you will be killed and your wife and children will be tortured. So he was terrified, of course. It was right before Shabbos and he got this news. And as soon as Shabbos was over, he decided that he's going to visit his Rebbe. And uh, his rabbi, the Bnei Yisachar, he took his horse and wagon and he snuck out and he traveled immediately to him to ask for advice. But as he is traveling, he realized that he's passing by a neighboring tzaddik, Umbar Rav, the author of the Imre Eish. He's passing by his city. And so he, why should he go and visit his rabbi? He, he, he has a tzaddik right there and he should visit him. But he was so 
emotional about his his condition, he, when he came to, to the Ungar Rav, he as soon as he walked into this, he, he drove his cor- horses into the courtyard, and this rabbi was in the middle of hold, holding court with the Hasidim and having the the festa meal we have on Saturday night, the Malava Malka. And but he was his Chaim was so like tormented by his fear, he just walks in and he, and he screams, You gotta help me, you gotta help me. And I need help, I need help, come on, I'm gonna get killed, help me. And so this rabbi was like, Take this guy out, this guy is not normal. And so Rabbi Yisuf Chaim looked at him and he saw the Hadith upon him, he saw the the beauty of his of his holy face. And he realized he's in the right place. He calmed down. He says, please, Rabbi, I visit all the tzaddikim of our time. I visit, I'm a chassid of Nei Yisachar. Please, let me hear me out. Hear me out. I have something I need to share with you. I'm just, you know, don't judge me just because of, of the way I am acting right now. I'm just, I'm tormented. Please, let me try to explain to you what's going on. So, the Imre Eish realized that this guy is, 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 is a normal person and just was, you know, he was just distraught. And he says, come wash and join the Malav Malka. He washed, joined the Malav Malka and he calmed down and he told him what's going on. The Umar Rav stands up, Imre Eish stands up and he starts walking and pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. And finally he says, the issue is over. Go home. It's okay. So what do you mean the issue is over? What's, what are you talking about? I have to, I'm going to go back there. The general wants to kill me and he, and he wants his ring back. I know what the ring is. He says, listen, you asked me, my, me for advice. I'm telling you the issue is now over. You can go. The gzera, the decree against you is now over. He went with his faith in the tzaddik to visit this rabbi and he left with faith in the tzaddik and he went back home with a happy heart that for sure things are going to be okay. He comes home and his wife runs to greet him. She tells him, you won't believe what happened. My husband, I need to tell you what happened. What happened was like this. The general, she had heard a, a shot, a, a, uh, a bullet being shot from the neighboring home where the general was staying. She knew what was going on. She went over and she saw that what happened was like this. One of the soldiers of this general had killed himself. What happened was that this soldier was the one who had stolen the ring and he was trying to hide the ring somewhere. And while he was hiding the ring, one of the maids that worked in the home of the general saw him. And just because she saw him, he was so frightened that he just shot himself. And she realized, um, his wife realized that this was Baruch Hashem, the end of her troubles, because now the ring was discovered. And she told this to her husband. And her husband asked her, at what moment, what, when did this happen? And she told him the exact time this happened. And he realized this was the exact moment that Imre Eish had said, the Gzeira is over, the Kriya is over. So, Baruch Hashem, that's the story I wanted to share and tells us how much faith we have to have in Sadiqim. And the Gzeira, the decree of the exile, as ever said so many times, is over. Time for the coming of Mashiach. And time for us to hear the shofar blown. And for us to come to go tonight immediately, Mamish, to Yerushalayim with Mashiach. A good Tavach and a Prelchavach.